citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voice. Welcome, so welcome. You know we welcome to, to another episode of the People Powered Planet Podcast, where we focus on solution areas, having ways of helping to solve some of the major problems facing our planet today. And today, I have a very special guest. Uh, Dennis Aftergut was a colleague of mine from way back when we were both working with the American Friends Service Committee in a program they had called National Action and Research on the Military Industrial Complex. Uh, of course, inspired by, uh, by President Eisenhower's great speech on that, but also we played a really key role in helping to find the economic levers that could help cut off the war in Vietnam. So uh, he's gonna to begin to tell us some of those things and, and some of the roles we played in that uh, in, in helping uh, to avert nuclear war as well. And, uh, but Dennis has gone on to become a, a shining star. Uh, you see his articles and op-eds all over in uh, major publications uh, uh, across the country, you know, most of the top publications. You can, I'll let him run through a few of them for you. But he's also published uh, as, a form, as a federal prosecutor. After leaving Narmak, he went on to become a federal prosecutor and he's collaborated with other federal prosecutors to play a key role in helping to preserve uh, democracy in America uh, and in the, drawing back the curtain on many of the excesses and abuses we face. So he's had a very, uh, a very fascinating career, but today we're especially pleased to talk to him because he's recently returned from a trip to Vietnam. And it apparently was a very touching and interesting experience for him because uh, since we had worked so hard uh, in those formative days to uh, to stop the war, it played pretty pretty key role in uh, helping do so. Um, it was particularly interesting to be meeting the people that he had been working with kind of long distance. So with that, let me just uh, welcome Dennis Aftergut. Pleasure to be here, Ike. <laughs> um, well, maybe we'll start off with just letting you say a little bit more about yourself and then lead into this recent trip. But first of all, tell us a little more about you. <laughs> well, um, before I tell about myself, I, I think what I need to say is that in 1973, at the American Friends Service Committee, I started working with someone that your audience is quite familiar with, Arthur Canagas. And I had never met anybody like Arthur Canagas. <laughs> one of the most creative, committed, full of ideas on how to make things better people I have met in my entire life. And what a pleasure it is to rejoin with him here. Well, thank you, that touches my heart. I, uh, the way I came to the American Friends Service Committee was that I was doing my alternative service as a conscientious objector. And I wasn't happy in the work that I was doing at a reformatory for uh, juveniles. I went to the American Friends Service Committee. I talked with a counselor there. He asked me, well, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I said, I would do something about the war. He asked, have you thought about NARMIC? NARMIC, as Arthur said, stood for National Action Research on the Military Industrial Complex. I answered, what's NARMIC? And probably within a week, I was working at NARMIC, and I did so for the next two years. So what, what, uh, what, how did that experience at NARMIC help shape your future career? The war in Vietnam in general and NARMIC in particular were my coming of age as an activist. I first opposed the war 
as a college freshman. At that time, I had to stand up to my own father who didn't share my view. My father loved me and uh, had a learning brain himself. And so that view changed over time, but I had to stand up for what I believed. And I had to stand up over the next decade, particularly at Narmic, where I was more active than any other time uh, in my then life. I had to stand up to our government. That was a period where those of us who, us who grew up believing that the United States government could do no wrong had to learn that wasn't so. And we learned quickly with the war in Vietnam. Hmm. So how did you go from being a, uh, uh, someone who was challenging the government to working as a federal prosecutor? That's such an interesting question, Arthur. Um, there was law school in between, a law school clerkship, all the conditioning that takes place in uh, institutions that are designed to make you a lawyer and a part, uh, a closer part of American society. And um, I do remember, I remember so distinctly that when I stood up as a federal prosecutor and said, Dennis Aftergut on behalf of the United States, at that time, Jimmy Carter was president. I didn't have to be alienated from our government. It felt really good to be on the same side as our government. And um, prosecutors do a lot of good. And doing good is really the through line, or trying to do good is the through line in my life, whether it was Vietnam, whether it was being a prosecutor, whether it was being a uh, civil litigator fighting for human rights, whether it was starting a school for uh, kids with developmental differences like my adopted son, or whether it's the writing, the political writing I do now, trying to do good. Uh, that's what I have tried to make my life about. What are some of the proudest moments you had of doing good as a federal prosecutor? It wasn't hard because uh, your job as a federal prosecutor is only to go after bad guys. And, but I will also say that I was proud as a federal prosecutor that if I had any doubt that I could prove someone's guilt, whether I thought they might be guilty or not, I had the authority, the power, indeed, the duty not to prosecute that individual. So we put some very bad people in prison that needed to be separated from society. Proud to say that many of them were white collar criminals. Others were high ranking drug importers, sometimes bank robbers. Uh, but, I, you know, if I think about the proudest times I had, I would say we successfully prosecuted an arsonist who burned, owned a lumber company, burned it for the insurance uh, money in New Jersey. I was in California. He moved to California and he did it again. He could have gotten away with that the first time. It's only because he did it twice that he got uh, the attention of the FBI and the attention of federal prosecutors. And one other one, other one Arthur, at the time, we prosecuted a white collar criminal who um, uh, defrauded uh, a lot of people and he received the longest sentence a white collar criminal had ever received and he deserved it and he needed it and society needed it because he was a con man just like the con man 
the United States was unfortunate enough to have as the 45th president of the United States. Some people cannot help themselves. Some people just do not understand that there are other lives that are just as important as theirs. Hmm. Other lives that are just as important as theirs. Uh, that takes me to Vietnam, where uh, to many people, these were goops, these were uh, blips on a screen for the pilots of the automated air war. Uh, the, 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 one of the programs we did, we did documentaries back then before they had home videos. So we had to do them on cassettes and people would show them and either read the script themselves and become public speakers or they would play the tape and uh, have a soundtrack. Uh, now, there, you began at, at, at NARMIC to develop a strong connection with, of course, ending the Vietnam War. Uh, and recently, you've just gotten back from Vietnam. Um, maybe, uh, well, let's, let's take a little step into your writing articles first, and then go to your reactions to your trip in Vietnam, if that's okay for you. So how did you go from being a federal prosecutor to being one of the foremost writers on uh, political issues in the uh, that have been facing the entire society in terms of preserving democracy at this time. Tell us a little bit about that journey and what kind of things you've been writing. Uh, well, there are many things between my being a prosecutor and my starting to write. The um, the catalyst was the election of Donald Trump. I'll speak a little personally now. Um, I grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust. I have a distant relative who came from the area where my gra grandfather came from, who is number five on Schindler's list. Hmm. When I was eight years old, I asked myself, if I had been a German, would I have been a righteous Gentile, someone who helped the victims of the Holocaust? And Arthur, when you're eight years old, the answer to these questions are easy. Of course. When you become an adult and you see the risks that are involved, the risks that were invo uh, involved for righteous Gentiles in Germany, uh, People lost their lives. Their families lost their lives. It gets a little more complicated. When Donald Trump was elected, it was easy for anyone who had given it any thought or who had watched who he was to see where it was going. And we see it right up to the present day. And so I said to myself, on November 4th, 2016, okay, the question you asked yourself as an eight-year-old has been called. What are you going to do? I just started getting involved in resistance work. I formed a little organization. I did some lawyering. And over time, I started to write, and that's pretty much how it started. In the resistance work, I met many important people, mainly based in Washington. I reconnected with uh, my law school constitutional law professor, uh, professor, Larry Tribe, and I've had the opportunity to collaborate with him and other well-known people who understand the danger of what's happening in our country the same way that I do. And in a nutshell, what is the danger and what's the, the, the link between uh, uh, the Holocaust uh, atrocities and what you see as the danger of the Trump, of a possible Trump administration, another Trump administration? <laughs> well, um, you have uh, this man who is um, the most extreme form of narcissist 
in the same way that the chancellor of Nazi Germany was an extreme narcissist, willing to do anything to enhance his own power at the expense of human beings and dehumanizing human beings in the same way we saw it happening in the 2016 campaign, Arthur, the way Trump dehumanizes people who do not worship him, that is where a Holocaust begins with dehumanization. And so what were the articles that you wrote with your former law professor? Well, um, we have, uh, we've written many um, and many of them analyzing uh, what Trump has done, many of them pushing very hard for Larry Tribe's former student and my former law school classmate, Merrick Garland, to do what needs to be done to hold this man into account for the crimes he has committed against the country and against the rule of law. Now, you've had some very compelling articles about uh, the, the whole investigation uh, and, and urged action. Tell me about some of the impact that your articles have had. It's an interesting thing, uh, Arthur. Um, and you asked where, uh, where I've been published uh, with Larry and with a former Republican Deputy Attorney General uh, just before Christmas of last year uh, in the New York Times, multiple times in the Washington Post, multiple times in CNN and, um, and the Atlantic Magazine. Um, but in terms of impact, one never knows the impact of what one does. And to me, what's important is not always gauging what the impact will be because the impact is so often outside our control. What's in our control is what we do. And if we believe as you believe, as I believe, in justice, in equal treatment, in fair treatment, in what you referred to earlier, Arthur, the humanity of every person. If we believe in those things, and if we do whatever small thing each of us can do to advance those values, when we live in those values, if there are values, we're happy people. And that's the only thing we can do. We can live our values and fight for the things that we believe in. The impact happens or it doesn't happen. It's nice when it does, but you can never guarantee it. As we read those articles, I very often felt like uh, you created such a compelling open and shut case. It was like I was sitting on a jury and you were presenting all the evidence and somehow in a, in a fairly quick summation, able to get the facts over, the, the, the law, uh, cite the law and draw a compelling conclusion in a way that I would think any jury member <laughs> reading your posts would, 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 would share that conclusion. You're very kind, Arthur. Um, what I've been able to do, like everything that we did at Normic all those years ago, like what you do, Arthur, is just the result of working in a movement, relationships with other people, building those relationships, sharing a common cause, and um, taking advantage of whatever gifts that the universe has given us. Well, uh, I think that 
the one of the gifts it's given us, of course, is is you and your both your very articulate way of, of speaking and writing, and your open heart. Um, tell us a little bit more, because I was I was so moved at an emotional level by hearing you tell some of the stories about your experiences in going to Vietnam. Uh, let's uh, let's take a segue into that, uh, and then later, of course, in the program, we're going to have a time for for our audience members to ask you questions and go into maybe more detail about some of the specifics you've talked about. But for now, tell us a little bit more about your uh, uh, your, your Vietnam experience. I went to Vietnam just thinking I've been so intensely involved in American politics in the larger sense of politics, I need to get my head in a different place. I thought I was going art. I thought I was going for R and R. I really did. I had no idea how in Vietnam I was going to connect with people there, some who had been involved as you said at the introduction, on the other side of the world in the same struggle for peace that we were involved in. And I had no idea how I was gonna connect with myself, a part of myself that I had forgotten as I moved from chapter to chapter in my life, I, I think it's a good quality that I've had that I don't, I never dwell on what I've done. I'm very proud of many things I've done in my life, but I never dwell on them. I'm on to the next thing. That's what is now. But I hadn't realized that there's something lost in that. Um, and that is the through line and not just the through line of values, but the emotional through line. You can talk, Arthur, about how strongly we felt. And I know you've felt strongly <laughs> in your life about a lot of other things you have done, but we fought so hard when most of America was trying to forget the war in the 70s under Nixon, when he Vietnamized the ground, ground war and automated the air war and dropped 3 million tons of American bombs on people. You and I felt that. And going to Vietnam, I felt it again. Wow. Well, the, uh, you know, people have talked here about 50,000 lives were lost, counting the Americans. <laughs> but how many Vietnamese uh, did we kill? The estimates start at 2 million. The number of civilians who died. And you can say we killed them. Even if not all of them were killed by our side. Most of them were, but you can say that we killed them because starting right after World War II, Harry Truman made some wrong turns, followed by Dwight Eisenhower and John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. And if we hadn't made those turns, those people would not have been killed. And the Vietnamese used the number 3 million civilians killed. That doesn't count the people that are wounded. As the 58,000 don't include the American troops who were wounded in body and in soul. And all those wounds and all those deaths completely unnecessary. The war was completely stupid. And what I, those numbers I just recounted don't even include the victims of 18 million tons 
of defoliant, Agent Orange, dropped on jungles, imbibed by people, showing up in children generations later with limbs that are either not there or useless if you travel, if you visit the photographs, if you see these young adults, you cannot help but feel the enormous damage to life, the harm, the waste that that war, and probably every war, if you look at its beginning, has caused. There's a very powerful moment in the fog of war when McNamara, one of the key architects of the war, comes to the realization that the whole idea that we were there fighting uh, to stop Chinese <laughs> advance when the Vietnamese had been fighting off the Chinese empire for a thousand years and then the, uh, the French empire for how many years they fight, fought off the French empire? A century. A century. And, uh, to think and, that by the out... way, and by the way, the Japanese came in 1940, kicked the French out, and they controlled for five years. Wow. And uh, they've had this resilience to all of that. Uh, but McNamara comes to the realization that all of the reasons, the falling dominoes never happened, the, the, all, all the reasons for the war were false, and that he ended up causing these million deaths. And there's a look on his face when he really takes that in that is so uh, memorable that in that film, The Fog of War. Uh, so, and that's one of the things you're doing now, exposing the, the lies that create policies that are totally out of touch with reality. Arthur, I just wanna say one other thing about that. Cause I've, when I travel, I try to read about the place where I am. And I've been reading a lot about Vietnam even McNamara's moment of enlightenment didn't, he didn't have to go through what he went through to come to that moment of realization. Arthur, in 1946, right after the war, the representatives of the office of what was it called? The OSS, the predecessor to the CIA. Yeah. It was called OSS. At any rate, officers on the ground who met with Ho Chi Minh, the head of the division in the State Department for Southeast Asia, both of them met with Ho Chi Minh separately. They wrote back to the State Department. Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist first and foremost. They told the government that he was a leader of independence. Ho Chi Minh wrote Truman in 1946, thinking that Truman and America would feel sympathetic to their war against colonialism as we had won in 1776 and the American government did not respond. All that information is in the record that we ended up burying as the Iron Curtain fell in the late forties, as McCarthyism took over in the 50s, no American president wanted to, quote, lose Vietnam, unquote, to communism. We can look back with 2020 hindsight, but we saw it in the middle, Arthur. That was completely contrary to American ideals, and it was completely stupid and the fact that when vietnam won 
uh, none of the predictions of all the her terrible things that were going to happen happened just proves the whole thing had no basis whatsoever. And in fact, one of the things that has stunned me is that the Vietnamese uh, seem not to, uh, overall, they seem to have kind of been open to Americans, uh, not full of rage at what we did. Uh, tell me more about that. Um, again, I'll just go back. The um, Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnamese leaders, were very, very smart. And from the very start, they said, our enemy is not the American people. Our enemy has become, unfortunately, the American government. And what you've described is right on point. I met in Hanoi a North Vietnamese pilot named Mi. Me has come to the United States. In Kentucky and in North Carolina, he has met with the American F-4 pilot who shot him down, Brigadier General then, uh, or later, uh, Dan Cherry. And the pilot that me shot down, <laughs> um, a man by the name of Ron Stiles, I believe. Cherry has written a book called My Enemy, My Friend, because they have become friends. Me understood at the time. Those other pilots were not my enemy. They were doing what they had been assigned to do, just like I was. And um, you just see that we are all human beings and we get caught up in the larger forces of history. And um, we end up as a pilot, he did, shooting down and being shot down by someone else who is not his enemy. Wow. Share a, a little bit more about some of the other individuals you met in Vietnam and the impact, emotional impact that had on you. I think the first time that I fell apart crying in Vietnam was just outside of Hanoi. We had stopped um, for tea. One of our, we started talking about the war. One of our guides described how her grandfather, this goes to, you know, what they felt of their fight for independence. Her grandfather was a teacher. He wanted to fight in the war for independence. He wrote his government and his government said, no, 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 we want you to be a teacher. Time passed, he wrote again. No, 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 you stay as a teacher. The third time, Arthur, he wrote a letter and they accepted him as a soldier. You know why? Why? He wrote that letter in his blood. I need to fight in his blood. Hmm. When we were in Hue, the, uh, one of the main places where the Tet Offensive occurred in 1968, our guide there on the way home from the airport we were talking about the war. Her father, she said, lost his arm. He lost his arm because he got shot in the hand. Out in the field, there was no Alan Alda. Out in the field, there was no MASH unit. There were no antiseptics. The gangrene climbed his arm. To save his life, two men held him down. Out in the field, Arthur, there was no anesthesia. Hmm. They held him down and they sawed off his arm. And in the car from the airport, we cried together. And when I say 
I reconnected to myself and I connected to these people. Um, I can't remember another more powerful experience in my life. I can't remember what I hope will be any more uh, any more powerful emotional experience in my life. Uh, I, I, and I, I can't remember what I think will be um, a transformative, so transformative an experience in my life. Wow. So it seems like around the world, we see mighty empires with far, far overwhelmingly greater military superiority trying to force people to remain in, well, what is really their empire, but force them to become uh, whatever we, we the, the empire thinks they should be. And we see almost everywhere it fails, from, from the British trying to conquer <laughs> America and other colonies, from, from uh, the Soviet Union uh, trying to beat uh, tribesmen in Afghanistan, with their mighty powerful military, the same thing again with uh, uh, the U.S. for 20 years of war, only pushing uh, them more in the hands of the Taliban, doing nothing for all the reasons we said we were fighting women's rights, whatever else. How can we help empires to learn that that never works? Force is never uh, effective to making to holding something together, maybe temporarily, but very shortly it starts to break apart because uh, there's no love, there's no bond in there. <laughs> I, I I hear the question you've asked yourself all your life, Art. Um, I want to believe with Anne Frank that uh, I continue to insist that um, all people are good. Um, but the people who um, get power <laughs> and and Arthur. Did I hear you mention Ukraine in that uh, in that list? I mean, that's the clearest example one can have, certainly in 2022, of how the will to be free, the will to be independent of a foreign power, is so much stronger than all that military might that Putin is supposed to have had. Strong men like Putin or Trump. And uh, if Trump comes back to power, it isn't hard to predict the kinds of things that are going to happen, not just at home, but in the world. Um, these are the people that so many human beings want to follow and enable, and they're the ones who seek personal and national power at the expense of everybody else. So- And manipulate people with their propaganda. And somehow what we need to do is to propagate a more clear, accurate view of the role of the world and that seems to be the challenge of, of, of activists and filmmakers trying to make a better world is to project uh, the realities that have been, uh, uh, that we've been fooled out of. And for example, uh, uh, on the whole nuclear issue, the day after, which we had the podcast with Nicholas Meyer, certainly shook up the, the uh, standing idea that we could just, uh, you know, fight and win a nuclear war that, that Reagan believed before he uh, saw that movie. Um, I guess what we need today is to somehow uh, uh, help shake people out of this lethargy into a, a, a whole new way of looking at the world. And, and uh, I guess you're, you're also uh, uh, helping a lot of that in the ongoing work that you're doing. Um, what are- uh... Arthur, Arthur, l let me just say, you know, I talked earlier about each of us in our own little way, um, uh, you know, uh, speaking of the work that you do, not so little, and there's no way 
anybody can exaggerate the importance of what you just described? Film, words, educating people. People can be educated as hard as it seems right now. Um, and not only educated, but um, motivated and moralized in the sense of the opposite of demoralized. So when people um, see the kind of things you do and the brain, it, it learns visually so much better than um, in other ways. That's why film is so important. Um, but everything that every person can do, large or small, accumulates. Mm. It makes the world a better place. Well, during the whole Vietnam War, the Tichin movement helped break, uh, uh, break down those barriers of propaganda and, and, and the power of the film. Our film, our, our documentary, uh, uh, The Automated Air War, uh, which, as I said, was done through slides and tape before <laughs> at home video, uh, that documentary uh, got heavily shown all on, on people would play it on on the trains going between Washington and DC on the on, on the edge of the end of the train car. They would play it on buildings. They would it, it went out all over the world. Uh, there's a uh, I was just noting a, a list here of some of the places where where it where it went out uh, to uh, reach. Uh, well, I won't go through it now, but just like so. Actually, all over the world, there were hundreds and thousands and, and, and well, there were probably over a million people that saw that and activated people and moved people to become activists. Uh, and I think one of the crowning moments of what we did in our work there, we were collaborating with the Indochina uh, Peace Center and we uh, and with uh, several of the people there, we put together uh, an alternative budget exposing the lies. It had uh, uh, they had a program they would call pacification and they would pass it off as this is part of development and we'll pacify the region. And then we would show that what that actually meant on the ground was uh, assassinating uh, mayors and, 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 and people uh, in, in their community. And we would take the other, other lies basically of the budget and we expose what it really was because see, after the war was supposedly over, we used the aid budget to fund this, uh, what we called the, uh, we called then the, post-war war. This was uh, one of the documents of that. And in that post-war war, uh, things got disguised that were really warfare, but they were given other more, uh, more uh, names to disguise the reality of what they were. Well, we created an alternative budget, line item by line item, that looked exactly like the official budget, but it said what the real purpose of each line item was, and then the price. And this is what you're really paying for. And Congressman Racine carrying that document into the, uh, the hearing room with them. Uh, and I thought one of the highlights was that when Vietnam finally rose and uh, the embassy was under attack and the planes were coming to rescue Graham Martin and others off the roof while, while Vietnam took back their property there, uh, the, the ambassador said, the war wasn't lost on the ground. It was due to these groups. And he mentioned specifically like the Indochina Resource Center and so on that that cut off our budget. That's why, why we couldn't keep this war going. And I thought, yes, yes, the ambassador is acknowledging that role we played. We can celebrate um, our own role. And I felt immense pride in that role in Vietnam. But what Graham Martin was saying was a lie. No, true. Yeah. That, oh, if only we had more money. Johnson and Nixon came to understand at a certain point that Westmoreland's message, if only I have more troops, wasn't going to cut it. And neither was, if only we had more money, if only these people had not been there. That was a losing venture and it breaks my heart to say all those two or three million Vietnamese lives, 58,000 American lives lost, and the hundreds of thousands of wounded in heart and mind 
and body. <laughs> it was a losing venture from the start. One more thing I need to say, that whatever contribution we made to bringing all that stupidity and wasted loss of life to an end, maybe we made a contribution like you say, but only, and this is a message I would give to anyone who is listening, only in collaboration with a larger movement. No small group, no small combination of groups. It's all the people who are committed to justice and willing to do whatever they can. I said before, small or large. In Vietnam, art, at the War Remnants Museum, there's picture after picture of Americans who paid a serious cost, not in losing their life, but time in prison for resisting. There's a picture of a GI saying we are one of 13,000, I think that was the number, uh, resistors inside the military. And he was holding a New York Times ad with the names on it. It may have been, it may have been a smaller number, I'm not sure. But the point is that people from all walks of life, mothers against the war, church and laity against the war, the people who, um, who poured blood on draft files in a nonviolent way, the people who burned their cars in a nonviolent way, the people who educated as we did. We were part of a movement. I do believe that together we had impact, whatever impact I or you or we might have had individually. Hmm. Wow. Well, this has been so moving. I wish we could go on for hours, but we need a little time here to have some questions and comments and reactions from our audience. So at, with that, let me thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much for being part of the People Powered Planet. And we will continue now with the question period as I turn it over to Melanie. Arthur and Dennis, thank you, thank you, thank you. My goodness. Wow, all this history that you and Arthur had together, what incredible work. And absolutely, it's a movement, a lot of people together. Uh, doing something together, collaboration is so important. And not to focus, like you said, on, on you know, your, what you're getting done. Just do your part. Just be there to help. So, yes, and by the way, we have a lot of questions. So I want to go to someone else who played a large part in stopping, helping to stop the war in Vietnam. So let's go to Frank. Frank, go ahead with your comment or question. Well, Dennis, thanks for everything you've said and everything you've been doing. I, you know, I did serve time in federal prison, so what can I say? Um, it almost seems that, you know, people either understand or they don't get it. So I don't know what the bridge is. What have you found in your own life is sort of the bridge for people? I mean, I can talk to people about what I've done. I mean, after prison, I was in business for 15 years. So I wear several hats. So when people talk to me, you know, I can say, oh yeah, I, was, I went out and made a living for my kids. You know, and yes, I've been against the war and I've written stuff and I've done stuff. But how do you sort of explain, like, you know, it seems to be the one thing that the government is never gonna do and that is give up on the military. I should say as an aside, that um, I've met people in the military who say that the there are a lot of people in the military who are against warfare. They think that it's stupid, it doesn't get anywhere. Just like if we went to nuclear war, we'd be dropping bombs on ourselves. So what, what they say is that, you know, the only thing is that the military only promotes you if you've been in a war zone. So what is, what is your, your perspective for people? What is the one thing you think that turns people away from looking at this insanity Cold War, which, which this isn't effective. 
<laughs> I mean, if you want to look at one thing we in America believe in is effectiveness. No, it's the wars are not effective. What is the one thing that you feel helps people make that bridge? I don't know what converts people. I know that people convert. Arthur described what happened to um, uh, Secretary McNamara. People do convert, but I don't think there's any one thing. And for some people, it's information. For some people, it's a film, as I talked about. For some people, it's uh, being personally affected. Uh, all, all, you know, all I can advocate is keep doing what you do, keep fighting for justice. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right there. You know, so let me just—I'll make this short, Arthur. Um, when I went on trial with the group, a group called the Minnesota Eight, we did the Beaver Fifty Five action in January, February, and then we did the Minnesota Eight action in July. We got arrested for the Minnesota Eight action, and when we were on trial. One day, this, the other attorney comes to me and he says, I was a pro se attorney. And he said, um, I have this fellow named Dan Lulsberry who wants to come and testify. We didn't know who he was. <laughs> so he comes and when he gets up on this witness stand, you know, the, the judge is like leaning over the dais to say, every time Dan would breathe, he'd say, objection. <laughs> so what was the story there? The fact is, Ellsberg will tell you later on that this was his last stop. This is the last time that he basically was trying to get the avoid going to prison and getting trying to get like the Pentagon Papers released as but well, he would say something and the judge would challenge him. So the fact is, you just never know is what I'm trying to say. You just you just never know, you know, which is what impact you're going to have. So so we had the so Ellsberg will tell you that we had this big impact on him. It's like, we, who are we? A bunch of kids up in Minnesota creating draft boards. So the thing is, you got to just keep moving forward. Just like I think you've been saying, Dennis, you know, we just got just gotta, gotta keep trying. You just never know what's going to happen. I love that, Frank. I love that. Yes. Um, you don't know what impact you're going to have. Isn't that a credible story? Um, I just want to say that also developing empathy is very important. I think that uh, people realizing that we are all we're all part of this group of humanity and, and to empathize and, and realize that we're all one. So I think that's important, but people learn different ways. So as teachers know, uh, there are different ways to teach people different things. So gosh, we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna go to Quanta, Quanta next. Quanta cannot, um, cannot show her video. Quanta, go right ahead. Sorry, hi. Um, I, I guess it will be pretty much of a repeat. Um, I am very, very concerned as we all are and that the younger generation is more preoccupied with individualistic aspects of social issues rather than looking at the collective global levels. And I'm not saying they're not at all, but I think that uh, if we were to sort of make a comparison so I do think, you know, I just put, uh, again, the Charlie Chaplin's talk in 1940 film, and as well as 1961, uh, Eisenhower's speech about the military industrial complex. And all these things converge really, they all come together. It's, they're not like fragmented here and there. But I think that the, the collective power of the youth is fragmented right now because they are being distracted with individual issues or group issues, it's, there's tribalism. And uh, so I'm wondering, for instance, you all have some connections that I don't have. I mean, I, I'm with Rotary, I work with the peace group uh, committees and diversity and equity and all that. But I think that we need to have clearly, stating picture of comparative analysis between what war has done in the last hundred years to humanity and to this nation. And then what would have been if there was no spending on war so the kids can see the difference. So they say, okay, this is what has happened in the last 50 years. And if we continue, and this is what, 
make an extrapolation what might happen in their lifetime 15 years from now on. So I'm thinking that, you know, it's wonderful that we come together and, and like I'm 70, almost 77 and we are talking about things that it's almost like a, uh, it's helpful, you know, to find people that are like-minded. But I think we really need to focus on the youth. We really do. So I don't know if you have any connections that this can be brought up and use Eisenhower speech and Charlie Chaplin and really make them feel it. Not just, emo like, not just mentally, you know, talking about these things, but really hit them in the heart mm. per se. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. There's a famous uh, behavioral organizational consultant. Uh, this goes to your last comment about um, about uh, hit them in the heart, uh, who says uh, too many people try to change, convert others through the mind, but the real process is feel, see, change. You have to start with feel. Um, and mostly people change by feeling something, then they're able to see it, and then they're able to change. Hmm. Great. Wow. Oh, quickly, let's go to Richard. Richard, you're next. Thank you very much, Melanie, Arthur, and Dennis. Uh, very inspiring talk today. Uh, I just came back from a cruise uh, down the Dalmatian coast and visited uh, Slovenia, Croatia, and Montenegro, which have been occupied by the Italians, the Germans, the uh, uh, communists under Tito, and now are finally free. And what I found it's interesting is how they respond to uh, their takeovers. And you can see this in their national anthem. The Slovenian national anthem is about uh, brotherhood and internationalism. The Croatian and Montenegro anthems are about the beauty of their country. But when you look at the Ukrainian national anthem, it is also about, they've also been overthrown and uh, been conquered by numerous groups over the years. And their national anthem is about fighting the conquerors and triumphing in the end and glory to Ukraine. And likewise, the American national anthem is a very much a, a military one. And so again, I come back to you is that, how do you win friends and influence people? You don't do it militarily. And uh, so, uh, and when you mentioned the military industrial complex, it's really the military industrial political entertainment complex, uh, because again, it comes all down to education and we're educated through films as Arthur uh, certainly points out with his film, The Day After, et cetera. Uh, and so again, I'm just wondering, uh, you mentioned feel, see, and change, but how do you, um, respond to the wealthy people who are pulling the strings behind uh, uh, us and uh, controlling the uh, uh, political and entertainment complex, as well as the military industrial. Just keep, um, you know, doing what uh, matters to me, what I enjoy doing. I like words, may or may not change anything. Um, Supreme Court decisions like um citizens united uh you know have destroyed our are on the way to destroying our democracy because as you say people who accumulate means people who accumulate power uh generally strive to keep it and do whatever they can to keep it and that's just an eternal battle that um i am sure you have been fighting well over your uh, lifetime. Mm. Wow. Well, let's go to Jane. Jane, go right ahead. I, I just really wanted to say how much I appreciate uh, this conversation today. Um, it's really 
impactful remembering Vietnam. I was um, 15 and I left Los Angeles to escape all the violence of the Watts riots. And then I had a boyfriend who had served in the National Guard there. And, it, and I learned later it was a full on war zone of our own people fighting each other. And then in 68, uh, I met him in 67, he got caught up to the Tet Offensive. And uh, I, we went to Los Angeles. Luckily he was a surfer who had a history of stomach problems from eating a bum taco at a Mexican taco stand. And um, a doctor uh, saved his life by writing um, a letter that he could not he, that he could eat fried foods. So it's kind of hard to be in US military and not be able to eat fried food. So we ended up driving to Viet, um, to, um, from San Diego to uh, Costa Rica in 1972 or 73. And he's still there because of um, the, the militarism of the United States. So I just wish that you would be able to get your word out last night on Democracy Now!, they had, or it was the night before, I can't remember, but Ralph Nader and I had put that in the chat about winningamerica.net, uh, .net, I believe it is. And I, there's a lot of, you know, he just felt, he was saying like what you are saying that on the talking points that people aren't hearing the talking points and where is this, it's not happening. And uh, even in the, in the movies right now, Amsterdam has gotten really bad reviews. And I, I just, you know, I heard, wow, it was about the overthrow of Franklin Roosevelt. And I went and saw it. And yeah, it's a little abstract, but it's such an important film. And I, I, it would, I just uh, hope your message can get through. And sometimes I'm thinking about leaving the United States. I was in Portugal, uh, but I feel like in that movie in Amsterdam, the, one of the lead characters, you know, he said, I got to stay here and, you know, and make a change. And I'm just so brokenhearted. And I just, uh, I guess that's all I have to say. And bravo for your work, all of you. Um, thank you, Jean, for that. Now, Michael, if you could go right ahead with the comment or question. Michael. Yeah, a uh, wonderful talk. It was definitely touching for me as well. So my father was an Air Force pilot in Vietnam and flew 108 missions in the F-105. And uh, I wish that, you know, he passed in 2003 and I wish that we had, you know, discussed his experience in the war more than we actually did. Uh, it was pretty limited and maybe it's because we were trying to all forget about it as a family. But uh, anyways, back to the current day, like uh, I like what you said, Dennis, you know, let's focus on the current moment. What can we do? And uh, we're working with uh, David Gallup in Washington, D.C. with the World Citizen Passport to take it onto the blockchain and start a type of citizen network where it's all about solutions. Uh, I appreciate what you do. And uh, boy, uh, 108 missions. That is a lot. And he must have uh, he must have gone through a lot. And one of his missions, uh, I think it was towards the end, uh, he got shot pretty bad and, and all the I remember that one story that he, that he did share with us and like everything on the displays were telling him eject, eject, you know, he was, he was all shut up and uh, he was over enemy territory and uh, he had a decision to make. He could eject, he could stay with the plane and he decided to stay with the plane and by some miracle, by the grace of God, he made it back to the, to Thailand, I think, uh, where he was based. And so he survived. But as I said in the comments, our, we, when I was a kid in Albuquerque, our neighbors were the Russells and their father didn't make it home. And uh, mm. we knew all their kids. And, you know, we were just, we were just torn apart. And it's just the, the collateral damages throughout society are immeasurable. War is, war is heartbreaking. These are horrible, horrible stories for, for everybody involved. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. I would say that um, hell has nothing on war. Mm. Wow, okay, well, now for our last question, let's go to Joanne, question or comment. Joanne, go right ahead. Okay, I, I kept on thinking, and, and I wanna thank you, Dennis, for reviving my emotions in Vietnam as well. I landed up marrying a, a man who had just come back from Peace Corps because in fact, he went into Peace Corps to avoid Vietnam. Um, not 
I'm, I'm sure that many, many Peace Corps volunteers did that as well. Um, but I'm thinking now of Ukraine because Ukraine obviously has captured the feelings of the world. But we are supporting a military solution. And how can we turn that issue around so it's not a question of fighting to the last death of whether it be the Ukrainians or the Russians? Um, it seems like that's the only road. Some of the peacemakers are talking about negotiations. Of course, that's the risky part. Will the Russians give up what they have wanted to, because they want it back? But how do we get off the idea of winning the game? And, and, and that means a mil some kind of a military um, finality, and I don't see how that can happen. And I, and I, I get, I get surprised and even encouraged that parts of the Republican Party are saying no more, no more military aid. Well, one time I'm actually agreeing with the Republicans. Uh, that's rare. <laughs> um, but I think I think that's right. Um, because that's exactly what what Putin is saying. You keep on supplying the weapons and we'll keep on fighting. So, so uh, that might in fact be a, a correct approach, but I don't know what others feel about that. I think it's very complex. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I could say to a Ukrainian, um, don't fight back. Um, they're, um, they're prevailing because they are fighting for their freedom and independence the same way the Vietnamese were. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, I don't know that it's the solution, but um, I sure don't have one. Well, I'd like to add to the mix the very important information about partnership societies. In other words, getting away from the domination where violence and war is very integrated, so integrated into our society where you just can't picture how else we can do this when when in fact there there are ways there are ways of having a society where we don't count on war and violence so if you haven't listened to our podcast on doc with dr rion eisler uh, that's she, she talks about that and the chalice and the blade i think it's so important for us to we were talking earlier dennis mentioned you don't want to be discouraged um, it's so important to keep this energy of, yes, there are solutions. There are great people doing things. And as far as Ukraine, I, I wish so much that nonviolence was being utilized. Nonviolence is so, so much stronger than the violent power. And um, they would do much, so much better with that. And then we have all these uh, Russians that are protesting the war and that's beautiful. So. There is lots of hope. And so with that, and thank you, Dennis. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will go back to Arthur. Arthur, take it away. Melody, I want to echo and thank you for your uh, positive uh, close there. And, you know, we're so right that heart is what moves people. That's why that's why movies can be so much more uh, effective because they touch people in the heart. Uh, it, rational arguments. You know, I, I learned that when I was working in Washington with we would go testify to Congress. We'd bring admirals and generals to testify. We had Paul Newman testify. It wouldn't turn things around until you hit people with their hearts. And that's one of the things that, that from the beginning of the, of the, uh, the, the, the NARMIC slideshow we worked on with, that, with Dennis and so on that had the, uh, you know, touch people's hearts by uh, uh, taking the, these moving, moving stories of the people who had been impacted by the war and showing how uh, uh, how these weapons manufacturers were directly, had a direct line to them. So in any case, I just want to thank Dennis so much for this, uh, such a heartfelt, uh, very moving time. And uh, so good to connect with that. And, and yes, there is, I think there's, you know, the crazy thing about it is that even though it's getting darker and darker, there's this ocean of darkness, you know, there is this ocean of light simultaneously of, as Melanie said, people getting electrified, getting acted, young people, you know, moving into action and, and things happen in a dialectic way where sometimes the most terrible things happen and out of that, some of the best things happen. We see that throughout history and, uh, you know, the whole birth of uh, the human rights the document, a Universal Declaration of Human Rights and so on came out of the horrors of what was happening in the concentration camps. And so, 
and, and, and the horrors of the war. So uh, it, 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 we are going to make it humanity because here's the thing, <laughs> you know, the only way to get through this is to, is, to, is to keep your mind on that powerful vision of what we want to move toward because that's what empowers us. That's what changes things. And if we let ourselves get discouraged, anyone in these tough situations, whether it's a soldier or anyone else who lets themselves uh, get resigned to that, oh, we're doomed, then they are doomed. It's when we keep that resilience, when we keep that go-to attitude, that's what makes it so we will, we will prevail. And humanity will, folks. Uh, you know, that's what happens. You know, I, I, always, I said to a scientist who was telling me, oh, humanity is doomed, there's no hope. And I said, well, you say that because you're extrapolating current trends. I'm a movie maker and I always know that at the end, the hero comes along to save the day. And as Leonardo DiCaprio says in that movie, in, in our movie, uh, the hero is all of us. And uh, you're one of those heroes, Dennis. And next week, we're going to have a chance in our club social for all of you to, to, to share your ideas and talks more about this and come back each and every week for the People Powered Planet podcast. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions heading in one way. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video.